Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 10th Annual Wild Wisconsin Winter Web Conference. I am Jean Anderson with the South Central Library System, and I am moderating the small and mighty track today. Assisting me today is Joy Schwartz from the Winifox Library System. Thank you, Joy. And we are glad to have you here. Our presenter for this session is Lisa Shaw. She will be discussing respectful human resources for rural librarians. So Lisa, whenever you are ready, go ahead and take it away and just let me know when you want me to advance the slides. Thank you so much. Um, at Maine State Library, we call that being somebody's Vanna. So thank you for being my Vanna today. Um, thank you all so much for having me here. I really appreciate the opportunity. I need to let you know first thing that this topic is so broad and covers so many things that we probably could spend an entire day on it easily. So um, we're really gonna be touching on the high points today. So if you could advance the slide for me, Jean. And this is the scope of our presentation today. Now, a lot of laws around HR and employment laws, um, you'll see are really directed toward employers, you know, that have 15 or more employees. And if you are a municipal department, that would include the employees in the other municipal departments too. So a municipal library, for example, this would also include, you know, the fire department or the police department or parks and rec. Um, a lot of small and rural libraries are independent 501c3s or even part of a small municipality. So the scope of this presentation is really to kind of put forward the best um, practices for what we could be um, deploying for our staff rather than just, you know, it's the law. Um, Nonprofits are generally um, subject to the same employment regulations as for profits. That's something and I do find um, some boards don't necessarily recognize. They're like, oh, well, we're a 501c3 same laws still apply. So we'll be briefly touching on the requirements, some basic requirements, won't hit them all, but we'll hit the important ones, hopefully. So today's focus is going to be mostly on the respect and the best practices versus just the, the legal thou must. Um, and we cannot obviously, again, cover everything today, but we will hit the important highlights and provide you some resources that hopefully you will find useful. And I'd also like to say the importance of this right now, I think we're feeling more than ever because there there is such a labor shortage nationwide. We're competing with many other employers now to keep our good people. And um, one of the surprising things that's coming out of a lot of research around why employees leave jobs, they won't necessarily um, stay with a job just because of the pay. A lot of it is how they're treated and how they are recognized in the workplace. And so those are some of the important things that we do want to touch on today. Next slide, please. So there are some non-negotiables right up front that are things that we must do. We must follow labor law. Um, and there are some local ones. Sometimes your town or county may have um, certain ordinances in place, such as ban the box, which is the... Um, uh, asking about a criminal background on an application, some places do away with that. State and federal laws also must be obeyed. And we do have some handouts that are part of this presentation. And I have pulled some stuff from the really wonderful uh, Wisconsin statutes. Um, they lay things out very nicely for you there so that you will find some of those resources to have handy as part of the handouts. Timesheets and other required documentation keep those. You have people working for you, you got to keep a timesheet, keep it on file, um, pay your employees regularly and pay them for the work that they do. And we'll look at um, job descriptions and some fair hiring practices to make sure that we are being as inclusive and human centered as possible uh, when it, um, hiring employees for the libraries. And again, resources will be included in the handouts. Next slide. So we're going to start with inclusive hiring and compassionate firing if you have to do that. It's never fun to have to fire somebody, but sometimes it has to be done. And so this is going to include some job descriptions, some interviewing questions that you may or may not ask, and how best to handle a termination if you must indeed do one. Next slide. So a lot of text here. I apologize for that. But if you're posting a job listing, um, please do be considerate of some of the following things. And a job listing doesn't necessarily have to have the full job description. 
but it should have as much as possible um, to be sure that you're um, not wasting people's time if they're applying so they understand the full scope of what it is that they are expected to do. And some of these um, points have come from Wisconsin's own fair hiring um, and avoiding discriminatory interview questions. And you need the essential functions of the job in a job listing and a job description. And one of the things I've learned and some of the trainings that I've attended over the years is a surprising one that we don't always think to include in the job description. And that is that you must show up for the job. Now, you would think that's pretty self-evident. But I have also seen cases since then where somebody was hired on, they had all these wonderful skills, looked like they were going to be a really good um, candidate for the job, they're hired on, and then immediately went on leave for several weeks. You know, just started and, well, no, I got to go. I've, I've got to go on leave. And if your employer doesn't know that, you know, this is going to be a bit of a shock. But if you didn't put that in your job description either, you know, they can come back and say, well, you didn't tell me I had to, to show up. So attending, you know, being, being available and reporting to work is kind of a basic thing. Lay it out there. Um, there are certain types of interview questions that are completely off limits and some that are actually pretty good ones that you may not have thought of that I have um, pulled for some other resources for you review how you advertise and recruit for your positions. If you're just doing word of mouth or just in the local paper, you're really not only um, shutting out a, a bigger, vast pool of potential candidates, but it could be kind of discriminatory too. Like, well, we only want people just in our area. Don't worry about if they're going to be able to move to the area or any of those things like that. If they want the job and they've accepted it, They'll, they'll, they'll get there. Uh, we have a very small town in Maine called Millinocket. It's, it's so small. The library was shut down. There was a lot of um, economic downturn in that town. And they were having a hard time uh, getting a library. And when a small group of people got together to get the library reopened and they expanded their search to out of state and really played up how beautiful the area was. And they got a crackerjack librarian from New York that moved to the area. And in the brief time that he was there, I want to say it was about four to five years, he got them a brand new library built. He put them literally on the map and became librarian of the year for the state there. So expand your search when you're looking for people. Don't just think, you know, I can only look for people around here. It's not good practice and it's selling yourself short. Um, if you're using an application form, be careful what's on that application, that it's not asking for anything that's off limits that we'll be seeing in just a few minutes. Um, if there are barriers for applicants who, you know, have need some reasonable accommodations, please be aware that you may need to provide those as well. And when advertising, be careful about the language that you use. Um, you don't want anything that's going to be ageist, like, oh, somebody that's young and energetic, you know, again, not only is it discriminatory, you're going to be missing some really great candidates. Next slide. So some interview questions, and here are some to avoid, and you'll see the source down below, Don Finn. He has a really great extensive AR training that he does on LinkedIn Learning. It is behind a paywall, but if you do have access to that, I highly recommend it. So questions you want to avoid when you're interviewing is anything that has to do with, you know, inquiring about somebody's race, sex, national origin, their age, their religion, um, any pre employment inquiries about their um, abilities or any disabilities or challenges they may have doing the job or any limitation questions. At this point, you're just interviewing. You have not made an offer. And it's not until you get to that that you need to say what sorts of reasonable accommodations need to be made for you to be able to do this job. Um, and no financial questions. I and mean, unless you're hiring, you know, somebody for a financial position, you do not need to be going into their financial background, no credit checks or anything like that. Um, yeah, the 50 pound daily activity, uh, reconsider asking. That's a good point, Mark. Um, is that something that can be accommodated another way? And um, that, that can put, a, you know, a lot of people kind of out of the running. And how often do they really need to do that? Personal background checks that would touch or hint on any of the back, uh, the above, I'm sorry, don't do it. 
Um, some interesting questions that uh, Don Finn here has suggested that are really good. What felt unfair to you in your last job? You can ask that. Are you able to meet the attendance requirements of the job as we discussed? Do you have a reliable method of transportation? Able to perform the physical and mental aspects of the job with or without accommodation? And Mark, I think that kind of goes to the point that you brought up in the chat. Are you able to work overtime if it's required? And you as the employer must be able to um, accommodate that in your salary as well. If the person is an exempt salaried position, you know, and, and there are certain uh, IRS requirements that you need to meet for them to be that, then they don't get paid over time. But if they are an hourly, they, they must be paid over time. And are you legally authorized to work in the U.S.? Next slide. So, um, and I want to add something real quick um, in here. If you do some hiring and you do background checks, um, you can do that. We used to do that as a municipal library where I worked. We um, were able to use our police department for that. But our police chief also shared some wonderful wisdom uh, once when we were talking about background checks. He said, all it will ever tell you, a background check will ever tell you, is what somebody got caught doing. Um, they may have done something and then made amends, you know, got their life together, and they may be a very good candidate. They may look really good on the background check, and then you get them, and it's like, oh, no, you know, they're, they're stealing from us or whatever. You know, it's a due diligence. Um, it's recommended for sure. But again, do keep that in mind. You're not going to learn everything you need to know about the person based on a background check. Um, if the time comes that you do need to terminate somebody, then don't do it in public. Um, don't do it in front of people. Don't do it in front of the other staff. And don't make a scene about it either. Um, don't lie about the reason that they're being let go. I mean, you don't have to, you know, make it a personal ad hominem attack. But if there's, you know, a performance issue that's been documented repeatedly or a behavior issue that's been documented repeatedly and they've been given a chance to set it straight and have not been able to do so, it's probably time for you and that employee to part ways um, for both of your sakes. Don't tell others about it. Don't gossip. And don't get into an argument with the employee about it. Um, if they start to get really violent or give you a hard time, obviously, you're going to need to call in some help from outside to deal with that. Do try to do it toward the end of the day, if possible. Um, do it midweek, if possible. No one wants to come in Monday morning first thing and then find out, oh, hey, guess what? You don't have a job anymore. And last thing on Friday, it leaves you feeling very helpless if you have to therefore face the weekend with, you know, you can't file for unemployment. You can't do anything, you know, except ruminate about what just happened. And you do want to do it in a private setting, but don't do the office if you can avoid it. I realize in small libraries, that's not always very easy to do. But if you can find a neutral space, because if you if somebody's in the office, and there's usually a window, and people can see that something's going on there, and they're going to start filling in with stuff. I do want to share a brief um, excerpt for you from one of the books that I recommended in the handouts when it comes to um, correcting or maybe having to let somebody go. And this is from one of my favorite library lovers. You may be surprised. Um, it's Louis Ferrante, who is a former mobster. Um, he has reformed. He did his time in prison and he's written a couple of great books. And one of them is um, Mob Rules, What the Legitimate Businessman Can Learn from the Mob. And under lesson 40, he has the toughest guys have the thinnest skin. Never embarrass someone in public. Coming up in the mob, I was filled with ambition, but not with experience. When I screwed up, I was fortunate enough to be around old timers who knew enough to lecture me in private and never embarrass me in front of other people. I was able to learn my lessons without being shamed in the process. Mobsters have emotions like everyone else. In fact, some are downright touchy. I've been up close and personal with killers, and they have the thinnest skin of all. They just hide their sensitivity behind a tough guy persona. That's why a stone cold killer's reaction to even a minor insult can be deadly. Knowing this, their bosses might correct them in private, but never embarrass them in public. Employees aren't volatile hitmen, but they can blow their stacks, suffer embarrassment, or harbor an eternal grudge. If someone screws up, correct them in private. 
And my personal philosophy that I always like to follow is praise in public, correct in private. Do share, you know, loud and wide when somebody does something really great. But if they need correction, do it quietly and do it to the side. Next slide, please. We're going to be going into evaluations. Before I do that, are there any questions at this time? If not, I'll continue. Um, not yet. Um, and I will just remind everyone, um, feel free to submit your questions either using the question and answer panel. With the question and answer panel, you can submit them anonymously if you prefer, or use the chat. And I, uh, Joy and I will be monitoring them and passing them along to Lisa as we go along. So go ahead. Thank you. All right. And this is going to be um, evaluations, going to be tracking concerns, but more importantly, successes and continuing professional development. Next slide. This was my former city manager. Um, I didn't name him um, by name, but he had shared this wisdom when we were talking about evaluations uh, when I worked for him years ago. I have the greatest respect for this person. And he said this and it stuck with me ever since. If you are hearing about an issue, an issue that he may have with an employee, with me, with anybody, if you're hearing about an issue for the first time at your evaluation, then I have failed as a manager. He did not ever want anybody to walk into his office for an evaluation with a pit in their stomach going, oh no, what am I going to hear? You should not have been hearing anything there. He hadn't already been talking with you before. And I thought that this was um, really great wisdom. He felt it was a failing on his part if any of us were ever side blinded by something he had to take corrective action for. So I really appreciated that. Next slide. So you've got a personnel file that you're probably keeping on your employees. Um, and an important thing to keep in mind is when you do put things in there, don't put more than is necessary, um, but do document. Do document if you have had important discussions that may lead to a promotion down the road, to a recommendation, or even to a termination. And if somebody wants to see what's in their personnel file, they do have the right to do that. They should sign if they've taken something out of that personnel file um, and then hopefully put it back in so you know what's supposed to be in there. And um, if there's anything missing, you know, who has it, who was the last one to act, um, access it. I have been in positions with nonprofits before where there have been investigations done and they will go and pull all those personnel files and you don't want um, suddenly empty files with no explanation of where everything went. It looks very bad. So do keep some careful records, but keep thoughtful records. So document any concerns, but especially successes and opportunities for growth for the people who are working under you. I have a, a, a colleague who's in workforce development here in Maine that I collaborate with quite a bit. And he told me the phrase once, sometimes I win, sometimes I learn. And what's important about this is that you're giving the people who work for you an opportunity to learn and grow as employees. That's a very important part of not only management, but of HR. Um, Human resources are humans that are meant to be developed into even stronger and better resources. And it's on us to give people the chance to do that. If your employees make mistakes, have their backs. Yes, you may need to go and have a discussion later on, again, quietly, in private, hopefully in a neutral place to say, well, here's what happened and probably how we should have handled it, or maybe they really did the best they could. Give them a chance to trust the learning process and to trust you as a manager. One thing that's going to come up a little bit later um, that's very important when it, when it comes to getting to know your employees, which is a pretty basic but important thing that we don't always think of, is that if you see a pattern of behavior that's concerning with one of your employees, consider that they may have an experience that they're bringing forward into this job. I had an employee at my library once who was very rigid in how she did things. And the idea of, you know, bending the rules or, you know, giving some kind of latitude to patrons for different things or whatever, which to me just seemed like, you know, great patron service to her was, was very upsetting. And I came to learn over time 
The reason for that is she had been in a previous job working for somebody and I knew who this person was. So it 100% resonated where she went above and beyond. She would do those extra things for the customers that came through their doors and they are always so happy, but her employer was like, you can't do that. That's wasting resources. That's wasting time, you know, and she was watched with a camera, you know, don't do this anymore. That above and beyond was punished. Once I realized that about her, it really gave me a much broader understanding that when she was resistant to, you know, a, a more soft and fluffy kind of approach to certain problems, it wasn't because she hated people or didn't like me. It was because she'd been burned on that in the past. So you need to give the people who are working under you the, the chance to trust you and get to know you and know you're going to have their back and not punish them um, for every little mistake. Next slide. Education is to me, probably the most important part of human resources and professional development being part of that, more so than documenting bad behaviors or anything else. Give your people a chance to learn and grow. It should be encouraged. It should be provided. It should be documented when it happens. But most importantly, it needs to be compensated. If people are, you know, going to a conference or they're, you know, taking some courses online, they they should they should be paid for that time. That isn't something that they should be expected to do on their own time. Now, some of them may want to, and that is okay. But you cannot ever expect an employee to take training, but then say, well, you need to do it during non-work hours. Those are work hours, whether they're doing it at home um, or in a class or going to a conference, compensate them for that time. And don't hog all the conferences for yourself as, as the manager, as the leader in your organization. You know, you may look at a particular conference that you go to every year, and maybe you don't see something all that exciting this year for you, but consider that your staff might or take them along with you if you can and plan ahead. Know that that time that they're going with you is paid time. And whether you offset it later, you know, with some hours or, you know, however you do that, do give them that compensation. Treat them as the same sort of professional that you are. And that travel time is also part of work time too. So do keep that in mind. Next slide. And we're going to be getting into a fair and accessible workplace talking about ADA, bullying, and civil rights. Once again, I'll pause for a sip and ask if anybody has any questions. Not yet. So All right, all right. let's roll. Next slide. All right, ADA, I think most of us are familiar with the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA. Again, this is um, a requirement that really kicks in with employers with 15 or more employees to provide a reasonable accommodation in the workplace. Again, many of us here probably don't have that many employees. Is it still best practice and a really good idea to provide those accommodations? Yes, absolutely. And Keep in mind that the focus of ADA isn't on the disability itself. The focus of ADA is on the limitations a disability causes that need to be accommodated. So this is not so much about, well, what kind of disability do you have? And that's not necessarily the question you wanna be asking either. Um, what you do wanna say is, what do you need in order to get this work done? Are you somebody who has, um, you know, an autonomic disorder that uh, maybe, you know, dizziness and fatigue kind of kicks in pretty quickly. And so they need to be seated, you know, even if they're at a circulation desk or something to be able to do their work. Um, do they need, you know, a certain type of a keyboard or a certain type of a monitor, whatever, to accommodate them? And it's, it should be reasonable accommodations. If, you know, there have, I've seen cases in the past where somebody's like, look, I'm going to have to sit with my feet up all day and somebody else is going to have to pick up the extra slack around here. Okay, that's not a reasonable accommodation. Yes, I've really seen that. I'm sure you all have stories too. That's not reasonable. Reasonable is something that is not above and beyond excessive, you know, cost or equipment or space in order to um, allow the person to do their job. 
The Job Accommodation Network, which is askjan.org, is a fantastic resource. I highly recommend that you go and check it out. Um, they have all kinds of resources there. Next slide. Bullying. What fun. Um, it is shocking to me to learn that abuse at work is the only form of abuse in America that is not yet taboo. It's actually encouraged in some uh, settings of, you know, that's just being aggressive and being dominant and owning the room and, you know, uh, just letting people know where it's at. And no, it's bullying. And um, it's not okay. It's not okay in the workplace. And in a library, bullying can happen um, between staff. It can happen from patrons bullying your staff. And it can happen with volunteers. So keep an eye out for this because this is not okay. Workplace bullying is defined as repeated health harming mistreatment by one or more employees of an employee. I should be employer, I apologize. Abusive conduct, uh, conduct that takes the form of verbal abuse, behaviors perceived as threatening, intimidating or humiliating, work sabotage, or some combination of the above. And there is an excellent resource called workplacebullying.org that is linked in this slide that you'll have access to as well. Next slide. So here are some quick um, statistics that come from workplace bullying. And one of them really caught my eye in particular, 43% of remote workers are bullied. And sometimes that can be coming from um, I think we've seen a lot of this, especially over the last couple of years, where you have some employees that their work depends on them being in the building, being in the workplace, and some that are able to do their work remotely, either full time or a few days a week or however that looks. And there can be that attitude of why do they get to just sit home all day and I have to be here and there's a lot of passive aggression that can kind of happen toward that you need to keep an eye out for that. It affects 76.3 million workers 30% of adult Americans are bullied at work fully one third. And two thirds of bullying is same gender bullying so we may think you know this this would include you know things like sexual harassment obviously and things like that but there's a lot of um you know what we would have called picking on somebody at school that is just again it's not taken as seriously in the american workplace as it is in a lot of other countries um and that's something that we need to keep an eye out for if we're going to be respectful for the people working for us next slide so one of the things that's um, really gaining some traction lately um, are when we have staff and volunteers that um, are LGBTQ plus, um, and there are some civil rights laws that are in place. Bostock um, versus Clayton County, which is Clayton County, Georgia, is a um, Supreme Court ruling that recently was found uh, in 2020 that um, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which, you know, uh, precludes any kind of discrimination based on, you know, race, gender, um, ethnicity, anything like that, religious background, does in fact include your LGBTQ plus employees against discrimination. Next slide, please. So you may have employees coming in um, who identify as a different gender than what they present as. They may not know what they present as yet, or they may be transitioning. And these are things that you need to give full support to. And it's very important not to hide this person in a back room doing cataloging or something if they want to be out front. You've got to support them. And I know that's really especially difficult in very conservative rural uh, communities, but that's really when they need the support the most. What we can do, a few basic things are to give employees the opportunity to let you know what their pronouns are. Um, You'll see that I have my pronouns um, in my name here on Zoom. Give your employees a chance to do that if you're having a Zoom meeting, if you have name tags um, that your staff wear. And if you don't, you might want to consider it just for the purpose of a first name and pronouns um, or an email signature 
that they use if they're sending out email from your library. And again, there's going to be uh, some really great resources that are in the handouts to help you understand what the different um, acronyms and things are. And some people may not yet know what their pronouns are. So if, you know, somebody appears female but identifies as non-binary, they, them, or he, her, uh, he, him, I'm sorry, give them a chance to um, express that. And it's okay if you mess up. I have a younger um, child who is non-binary and the, um, they were born male. And so every once in a while I slip and say he, and then I apologize and I say they, and, you know, they get it because it's just, you know, after so many years of doing one and, you know, to try to remember to do the other, it's being respectful and saying, I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to remember. Not respecting pronouns is a form of workplace bullying and discrimination. And I do see that we have a couple of questions coming up in the chat. Um, so I'm going to take a minute to address those. Before yes. we um, so the first one is, do you have any advice for handling situations in which a patron is not breaking any rule, but is making multiple employees feel extremely uncomfortable, like asking about staff's relationship status, staring, following, unwanted gifts, et cetera? Oh, yes. This is still bullying. It is. I had a um, patron years ago in a library that I worked at that came in and would follow me around the building all day. Just stand and stare, stare through the stacks. And, you know, I tried to broach it. And, you know, at first it was like, well, there's no law against staring, you know, and what if they're not really doing anything, you know? And I said, what has to happen to me before some action can be taken? And um, this does kind of fall under almost like stalking type behavior or anything like that, um, that person probably needs to be taken aside. They may just not know, first of all, um, that this behavior is not okay. You're here to work. This is not um, a dating platform. This is not a social club. You're here to work. You know, somebody's, you know, relationship status or anything like that. If they want to self-reveal, you know, as part of their own day-to-day -day conversation, you know, that's fine. That's on them. But it's not something that you should go asking. And so that's going to be a conversation that you take somebody aside and say, um, you know, I, I hear this. Are you aware that, you know, this sort of thing is not um, appropriate in the workplace? Because some people literally just don't know. They don't know what they don't know. And hopefully that is a conversation that can help that. It's also a good opportunity um, to look into maybe some staff training around that sort of a thing. Um, and again, this would be a work time. If you have the means to be able to even get everybody together for an hour, close the library to the public and say staff training and do that, I would highly recommend it and as paid time. And that's one of those things where you know, in the personnel file, you can say, you know, we had a training on this, we had a discussion on this. Then if you start to see that they're not paying attention, it's getting to be a repeated pattern of behavior, that documentation, like, okay, you did attend this training, you know, you did acknowledge that, you know, this is not okay to do, and yet you're still doing it. And that's when it's going to be, you know, that you're going to have to move forward and hopefully not have to end in a termination. But do be prepared that that may be the case. Um, and if it's a patron doing the asking those questions of staff, um, I, uh, I don't remember which session it was in, if it was yesterday or today, um, but one of the presenters said, um, and do you have a library question? And if they didn't, you know, so that, and I don't know how else to um, stop that conversation, but I really appreciated having that um, uh, a way to bring that conversation back to the library focus. Um, so that's, you know, so if it's a patron having that, do you have other, any other suggestions if it's a patron um, behaving in that way towards a staff member? Absolutely do. Um, this falls under your um, behavior policies. So have those policies 
you know, those behavior policies, especially posted at the entrance, and at any point, such as a reference desk or a circulation desk, and I'm not talking about pages of text, but just the main crux of the behavior policy, right handy. Um, I have had a couple of instances in the past at two libraries, um, two different libraries that I've worked at, where we did have a patron that was harassing staff, and sometimes even you know, following them or harassing, you know, other patrons. And at some point, you know, you, you may have to call in law enforcement to deal with them. Now, even if what they're doing isn't violating the law per se, um, if it's violating your policy, you can ask them to leave for the day. If they cannot circle back around to, you know, you're here to work, we're not here to date, that's not what this is. If they can't wrap their head around that's what that's what is the scope of behavior that's expected in this place, they can be asked to leave. And that's something that you can rely on your policies for, for sure. It is your primary responsibility, hear this, as HR, as director, as manager, as leader, it is your primary responsibility to look after your staff. If your staff are making it uncomfortable for the patrons to come into the library, that's another story. That's a staff human resource problem that needs to be addressed. That's a behavior training documentation issue that needs to be addressed. Do not, please do not throw your staff and volunteers under the bus for the sake of a problematic patron. Um, staff first. Ye they're depending on you for their income, for their job. Please look after them first and then look after your patrons. Thank you. Oh, um, Emily, I'm glad to hear that. Yes. <laughs> um, the next question is um, actually relates to what you have on the screen right here. Um, and I think you mentioned this. So what is best practice for name tags and phone answering? I have staff who are concerned about giving full names. And I think you had mentioned first names. First name. On the tag, on the yep. Um, so, um, first name and then pronouns and, and the phone, you would just do your first name sure. for the library, right? Okay. Exactly. And, you know, people are going to make mistakes. I mean, sometimes somebody may have a very deep voice and, you know, they're, you know, a female who identifies as female and, you know, so do understand the difference between an honest mistake and just disrespecting somebody's identity. Um, you can usually tell if somebody is really just trying to push buttons or, you know, pointedly say her to somebody who very clearly is self-identifying as non-binary. Again, that's bullying. That's a behavior problem and it should not be tolerated from either other staff or from your patrons. Thank you. I think that's all sure. the questions so far. All right. Let's go to the next slide. So now we're going to talk health and safety, oh, the time of COVID, and even beyond. So next slide. Telework. This is a whole new world for the most part, um, not necessarily everywhere, but it's in a whole new world for um, a lot of libraries to have to deal with that, you know, had to shut their uh, buildings to the public, but still try to keep people um, working from home. So under um, the Americans with Disabilities Act, employers must take whatever steps are necessary to make sure that an accommodation is effective absent undue hardship, and that's undue hardship on the part of you, the employer. Regarding telework, this can mean providing equipment, technical support, and additional accommodations. Um, and there is a flowchart at, this is again, the um, Job Accommodation Network website that I mentioned earlier, that um, there is a toolkit there to help you go down through and decide what you need to provide. It may be that somebody doesn't have a computer at home, so you would need to provide um, a work computer, um, maybe a work phone. Now, something I'm going to add here that's not in my slides anywhere. Um, if you are providing a work phone, and if somebody's doing work from home, they should have a work phone. I, I am now a two phone person. Personal phone, I have a work phone. Um, if possible, and it doesn't have to be anything really elaborate, <clears throat> you don't need to go out and buy an iPhone, um, but do provide a separate phone from work. The communications that happen 
on these devices are discoverable, again, with my air quotes, but if there's ever an investigation into, um, you know, uh, problematic behavior that gets elevated to litigation, the text, the emails, all of those things that somebody has exchanged um, can and will be pulled as part of that investigation. And you really don't want to have to go after people's personal devices. Um, so do make sure that your staff all have the ability to set up a work-related email, even if you can't get them on, you know, uh, employee at yourlibrary.org or .gov or whatever. Um, if you're using Gmail or whatever, best practice is really to have them set up a separate email. Or what I've done with my Gmail, I'm on a few different boards outside of my work. I'm on a um, municipal planning board and a couple of different nonprofit boards. <clears throat> and I have a signature in my email um, templates for, you know, am I responding as just Lisa? you know, human being, or am I responding as a planning board member? Am I responding as, you know, president of this board or whatever? Something that separates those out. So if you ever need to pull those communications, if anybody ever needs to pull those, um, that's that confines the scope of the search to just the stuff that's relevant and not, you know, all the times that I ordered from BoxyCharm or whatever. Nobody needs to see that. But um, do have a way to keep those communications separate. And another important thing with working remotely um, that's important to touch on is when people um, out of good intentions are doing extra work from home that is off the clock. And this may be posting to social media, answering email questions from patrons, um, you know, phone calls coming in after hours, whatever. Um, make sure that your employee understands very clearly and you yourself if you're hourly that after a certain number of hours, boom, you're off the clock. Um, it, it seems like a kindness to be answering emails or posting social media or replying to comments or whatever after work hours. But the Department of Labor says that that is the phrase is work suffered. And they must be compensated for that, even if you didn't assign it. You have to tell them to stop. No matter how well-intentioned it is, they need to not do that. So be very clear, not only about what you know, needs to be done during work hours, but what not to do off work hours. Don't do any work off work hours. Um, you probably haven't budgeted for that. So it's really not um, a, a sign of a above and beyond dedicated employee to be available 24 seven. Um, there's work and, and there's life and that needs to be separated. The Department of Labor was set up to protect workers. And that's why they have these rules that protect workers from, you know, well, you're just kind of on call 24 seven if you're working from home. No, you're not. There's work hours. And then when you're done, you're done. I work from home. As you can see, I'm in a corner of my living room. But when I'm done for the day, the computer goes off, everything goes off and I walk out and I am done. So that's, you know, an expectation that you really need to especially keep in mind with teleworkers. Next slide. So for staff that are still having to report to the building during COVID, um, protect your staff and your volunteers from disease transmission burnout. Watch out for that one. They're human beings. Put the human in human resources when you're doing this. Again, protect them from bullying from patrons or other staff. And especially during the time of COVID, note that the staff and volunteers that may be getting the passive aggressive bullying behavior the most, maybe your older staff, or anybody who appears or identifies as Asian American at greater risk. Um, again, with the behavior policies, post them, especially the high points very clearly, the entrance and any place where they're gonna be coming into contact with staff. This is behavior that's expected and or will not be tolerated. Next slide. So these are some final thoughts that I wanted to give you. Um, this is one of my favorite scenes from Star Trek um, Beyond, and, or Into Darkness, I'm sorry. Um, it's the, the reboot for those who follow Star Trek. But that one scene between Spock and Chris Pine's Captain Kirk, where, you know, Kirk is having to go and do something, you know, 
to protect his ship and protect his crew. And Spock is like, I'm going to go with you. And Kirk says, no, I need you here on the bridge. And he says, I cannot allow you to do this. It is my function aboard the ship to advise you in making the wisest decisions possible, something I firmly believe you are incapable of doing at this moment. It's really nice to have that staff person that's um, not afraid to call you out. And Kirk responds with, you're right. What I am about to do, it doesn't make sense. It's not logical. It is a gut feeling. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. I only know what I can do. And I actually have that phrase on my office wall. The Enterprise and her crew need someone in that chair who knows what he's doing. That's not me. It's you, Spock. And I do have contact information um, at the end, I think on our last slide, if I'm not mistaken. So please reach out to me with any questions. I do also want to add um, a couple of things that I pulled from some additional reading that I did. And it, one of them is on miserable employees <laughs> or miserable workplaces, more to the point, um, dehumanizing uh, workplaces. And according to one of the books that I recommended, which is, um, let's see, Leadership, nope, 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 The Truth About Employee Engagement by Patrick Lencioni. I really love his stuff. Um, three things that will create a miserable workplace for your staff, that's what you're looking to do, is anonymity, not taking the time to get to know your employees as people, irrelevance, not taking the time to let your employees know how their work matters in the greater scope of the community and in the work that you do. And in measurement, not taking the time to give your employees a chance to learn, to grow, and to track how they've improved over time. So um, remember, you're dealing with human beings. This is human work first. And that is my presentation to you today. Again, there's so much more I would like to have thrown in here, but uh, there's a lot to cover. But these are the main things that I really wanted to leave you with today. And any additional questions? Thank you, Lisa. Um, turn my video back on along with you. Um, so uh, if you we do have some time, um, if you so if you have questions, this is your opportunity to have Lisa answer them. Um, go ahead and use either the questions panel or the um, the chat um, area. I was going to say chat button, but that's not the right word. Um, the, <laughs> so feel free to use the chat. Um, how long can we access your handouts? The, the handouts will be um, available on the post-conference resources pretty much indefinitely. Um, if you look back at our post-conference resources, we have resources going back almost to the beginning, I think, of trustee training week, or not trustee training week, sorry, that's August, uh, of Wild Wisconsin. So there is almost 10 years worth of um archives there so and i saw that you just put in a a link lisa i did that's one of the things that um i came across just in the last couple of days that i wanted to share out this is from a site that was originally think hr it's now um, trust mineral but this particular link is to free resources particularly around covid um, that are downloadable templates um, that you may need to use during a time of COVID in your workplace. And they include templates which can be adjusted for your library and your local um, laws and regulations. There's a COVID-19 workplace safety pol policies and acknowledgement sheet for you to go down through, sign, um, and some different things like that. It's worth checking out. And I do see there's a question from Karen. Yes, so thinking of compensation for travel, what are your thoughts of compensating staff to work at a branch different from where they were hired at as a sub if their travel time is longer than, in quotes, what they signed up for? So in this case, Karen, um, may I ask, um, is, is the branch part of the same employer or is this for a different one? Um, and, and while you're clarifying that, Okay, it's the same system. Um, yes, if they're having to travel in connection with that job um, and it's beyond the normal commute, then they, they should be either, you know, by time or by mileage be compensated for that. Now, the way the state handles it here in Maine and it's probably pretty standard, I live in Bangor and that's where I work from is Bangor, Maine. The state library is located in Augusta. Now, um, if I have to go north, 
north of Bangor and Augusta is, is south of us to visit a, a library. Um, my travel time is based on the closest point to that library between my home and you know the state library. So for example, if I were to go to, you know, if I were working out of the Augusta Library on a particular day, the State Library needed to go to Portland further south, my travel would be from the State Library to um, Portland and back. So it's that additional travel time beyond their normal commute that you would um, probably want to compensate them for. Um, if, you know, if there's a, if they're traveling to one place regularly, you know, that's a commute time that that's kind of on them. But if you're asking them to go to another site, then yes, that additional travel time should be taken into consideration, unless it's closer to their home. In that case, you would, you would not need to worry about that because it's within the expected um, commute time. Thank you. And then um, another question. Um, any suggestions on how to deal with a library board member harassing or bullying the library director? Oh boy, library development, we see this a lot. Um, it's so frustrating to deal with because a lot of that is under local control. Um, if you have any kind of a state agency, Maine, for example, has Maine Association of Nonprofits, but also um, the, uh, the 501s and the boards are, um, if it's a 501, the boards um, are formed under the Secretary of State's office. So um, a human rights complaint to them if it's something that's really egregious or maybe even um, talking to the board chair or um, if it's if it's a governing board, then you would treat it like you would treat an employer who is over them. Somebody is over them, you know, and that's who you would need to talk to first um, because bullying is just not acceptable, period. So um, some of the resources that I've given do have ways to file um, complaints if you're being harassed and bullied. If it's an advisory board that's part of a municipality, then you'd need to go to your municipality and say, look, this person is, is giving me grief. They got to go or I got to go. One of us is going to go. And I've seen both things happen. Um, worst case scenario, we've in some cases we've just had to tell the librarian, you know, you might you might be better off somewhere else. Uh, you're too good for this. You, you don't deserve to stay here and get this treatment. Thank you. Um, and Mary um, asked if this is going to be uh, given during trustee training week, and I might be in contact with you because I plan trustee training week. So there might be um, something that we can do for boards on this topic and whatnot. So um, I, I might reach out to you again for this. <laughs> um, oops, I hit the wrong button. Sorry about that. Um, let's see. Um, and someone had asked, uh, and I'll just refresh or, and Joy, if you want to put in the chat the link to the post-conference resources, um, by next Monday, all of the handouts, and I think Lisa had sent another one to me or to Jamie like yesterday or today. So all of the handouts that she sent along with the slides and the recording will be posted on the post-conference um, part of the website. Thanks, Joy. Um, and did I miss any questions, Joy? I think I caught them all. You just want to double check me? And again, if moment. anybody wants to reach out to me, please, please do so. I'm here with, this is my staff now, uh, the Winter <laughs> Soldier, Doctor Who, this is my staff now. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I was going to ask you who those were. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you all so much. This yes. was an honor. Oh, thank you. All right. I'm not seeing any other questions that are coming in. So um, I, Lisa's contact information is there if you need her. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and close. So thank you again so much, Lisa, for that great session. I so appreciate it. Um, there will be a short survey at the end of the webinar and will also be sent to your email. We do really appreciate your feedback. Our closing session is coming up at 2.30 featuring Dan Gingas presenting how a remarkable customer, customer experience can be your best sales and marketing strategy. We hope to see you there. And if not, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.